Hey, this is Metal Rob along with Carcass John. And welcome back to episode 5 of the Metal Roundtable. We hope you've stuck with us this long. We think you have because we bring only top shelf, <laughs> VIP level quality program. That is correct. All right. Well, we want to start with a couple of shout outs today. And I am stoked because I got this in the mail yesterday from the band Dagan. Check them out on Facebook. They just did a successful campaign to launch their newest album, which is called Back to the Sea. This is my favorite extreme metal record of all time. I know. I know. I know. Okay, okay, wait, excuse me, excuse me. That you know. My favorite extreme metal band of all time. Mm. This is a great album, though. Okay. I, it, I just got it. Uh, I think you'll dig it. Man, this thing's got everything. It's got melody, it's got death metal vocals, it's got twin guitars, uh, leads, it's got foam shark fins. It's just amazing. Here, we can do a little... Oh, I have, to go, I have to go this way. You have way. to go that way, because that's the... Oh, does he have to... In the waves. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, check these dudes out, man. You can find Dagan on Facebook. They are on Luxor Records. I believe it's luxorrecords.com. My old eyes are having a very hard time reading this fine print. But anyway, check out Luxor Records online. Find Dagan. And John's got a shout out about uh, his favorite underground band. Uh, Turbid North. Um, migrated from uh, the, the frozen tundra of Alaska. Uh, they were told by some guys at Drowning Pool. They opened a show for him. They said, hey, you should come to Texas. You'll get signed. Fast forward ten years later. <laughs> and they're still working. And... It's kind of weird. They've I, I've I've known them since the very inception of the band here in Texas, and um, they just released Eyes Alive, which is a killer killer record. And talk about has, has something that has the extreme highs and lows, uh, mix um, malevolent creation with uh, Pink Floyd, and uh, you have this weird juxtaposition that yes. sounds sounds kind of cool. Um, and uh, but but ironically, uh, their first demo and album sounded a lot like Pantera, and we sort of talked about Pantera at the end of our last episode, and so that was a huge influence from them. But if you listen to their first album compared to Eyes Alive, you would say, wait a minute, that sounds like a band that's progressed quite a bit from the Pantera knockoff thing. That album definitely sounds to me like if. Pink Floyd made a death metal record. There you go. That's exactly what it sounds to me like. So, Pantera band, huh? They started off sounding a lot like Pantera, so check them out. Uh, Under the Eight was their first album, and I know, Nick, I'm sorry, nobody's supposed to know that. But uh, <laughs> but um, anyway, they've, they, they've molded themselves from a five-piece into a three-piece. Uh, they've actually got John O'Garrett, who's a killer, killer grindcore drummer, has been in Kalia and Protest and some other great local bands, and, um, and, and Chris O'Toole, uh, all my friends were zombies, and he was uh, Savage Messiah in England before he moved over here, and uh, graduated from North Texas, and just decided to stick around, so they're quite an international band, you've got a member of, from Alaska, a, band, a member from England, and a member from here in Texas, so, killer, anyway. Well, speaking of bands influenced by Pantera, that brings us to our main topic today, the band themselves. I like to call them that little old band from Texas, although I think ZZ Top I think already ZZ Top, well. Yeah. My little old band from <clears throat> Texas is Pantera. How about the little old heavy metal band from Texas? Oh, look at these guys. Look at that. I don't know. That doesn't look so heavy metal, Rob. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. I Honestly, we're going to just fly through these albums real quick that they've done. I didn't know about this one when it was first out in 83. I was a little late to the party. It took another couple of albums before I got into them. Uh, this is cool to have. It was listed as one of the worst heavy metal covers of all time online. <laughs> I'll leave that up to you to decide, but there it is, Pantera leave Metal Leave your comments Magic. down below. Yeah, from Arlington, Texas. Let's get into it. Now, this is where I picked up on these guys, was Projects in the Jungle, the second album. I, You have a tale of two bands, like, like you were saying before the show. Um, these dudes... 
this is two different bands, and we'll show you the progression. This is full on hairspray, makeup, spandex, glam metal. I mean, it's heavy, but it's solos and it's you know, it's docking sort of. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. It. So then we get, I am the night. I know, he's still cringing. <laughs> Look at that. They've come into their own here, making records every year. Do you, do you have a pair of pants like that? The red and black stripe? I oh, wait, you know what? I'm sorry, am I... No, no, no. I was going to say no. That was going to be my immediate response. But you know, I owned black and blue tiger stripe spandex <laughs> pants back in... Yes, I did. Well, we all have our deep, dark secrets. Now things begin to change. Mm -hmm. Power Metal comes out. Uh, exit Terry Lee. In comes Philip H. Anselmo. And the band changes. It's a little heavier. It's a little darker. This is my favorite Pantera record of all of them. I love this. I saw them two or three times on this tour at small clubs. Um, I've got a, a bootleg from this tour, a live bootleg there's stuff on youtube you can find but man this is where they changed as far as i'm concerned when did you get on board well i was on board with uh cowboys from hell now i will say about this album i came i circled back around to this because of the fill factor but isn't it interesting that they didn't change the the core of the band the two abbott brothers right. and rex and they just interchanged these singers until they found the one that put them over the top, so to speak, and this is a real transition record. You get a little bit of that poser hair metal thing, and we know that Phil had a tremendous range back then, mm -hmm. but then you could feel it starting to heavy up just quite a bit. Absolutely. So I, I can't argue with that that's one of their better albums. I don't know if it's my favorite, but it's, it's pretty darn close. Yeah, you could tell the corner, they were turning the corner on Down Below, Death Trap. Some of those songs were getting a little heavier, a little faster. Um, I don't and, know about that last track, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were still clinging to that. Uh, I saw him do that one live. <clears throat> they were still yep. clinging to that hair metal thing. I have a picture of Daryl singing that song. Oh gosh. <laughs> now, here we go. They get signed. Oh, is it glaring? There we go. Yep. Cowboys from Hell came out in 1990. I saw these guys uh, still supporting power metal. I saw them live and they played. The Art of Shredding Ooh. and something. And they didn't even have lyrics for the oh, songs man. yet. They were making... Phil was up there sound checking. And they were making up words. Just messing around. But the riffs were The Art of Shredding. I think it was The Sleep was the other song. And this... They said they were the kings of heavy metal. I argue against I, I think they just uh, <laughs> slayed whoever was there before and sat themselves on the throne. Yeah, this thing that. this thing is just great. You still get a couple of slower songs. Um, you still get some high Phil Anselmo vocal. You, um, but, they, but you also get a little bit of hardcore. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a whole bunch of different stuff on here. Uh, greatness. This was the springboard for what would happen. Well, and I think that it could be argued that uh, between that and the next one, Vulgar Display of Power, that probably saved metals uh, from completely going away. Oh, yeah. I mean, this this became like a grunge version of power metal, and, and thank goodness that we had heavy music again. Yeah, think about what was going mm -hmm. on in 1992. In music. Uh, Grunge yeah. had almost completely killed our music. That was what was so ironic about that one tour is that Alice in Change was, was opening for Slayer, Anthrax, and Megadeth, and yet they were the ones that were about ready to ruin the, yep. the entire metal business, yeah. and quote they, unquote. And not to go off on a huge tangent, but Alice in Change was one of those bands, to me, I considered them a metal band. Um, I just thought the way that they delivered the goods on those records, to me... Uh, especially on the first two, that to me is a metal band. I hear the grunge thing a little bit, but I felt like they were kind of lumped in with that. 
love Alice in Chains. And in fact, the way I found out about Facelift was at this tour in Dallas at the Arcadia Theater. They were playing it between mm. sets. Yeah. And, and I thought it was great. And once again, leave your comments. What do you think about that? I, yeah. I can't totally disagree with you. Um, I, I don't think they were a straight-up grunge band, but and they had some metal aspects, and I think that's why they were invited on that tour. Yeah, I agree. So I'm going to cover this one up a little bit. <laughs> it's the original cover. I forgot they reissued it that way. This is Far Beyond Driven. Sorry, Ooh. guys, I'm going to do the responsible thing and cover up the artwork. But this thing... Is brutal. <laughs> absolutely. And this is probably where you gained interest more and this is where i started falling off with it a little bit yeah well that's a brutal brutal record and the subject matter uh is uh, life-changing to some and and we're we're reading a we're reading a heavy metal diary here is what it is and it's sad and scary and mm -hmm. And uh, brutal. That's all I can say. Well, some of their best songs are on here. <clears throat> Becoming, Five Minutes Alone, I'm Broken. Ugh, just fantastic. That's just a triple threat of yep, greatness right there. there. I was able to go back later and get into this more as I got into heavier, more extreme music. I started to get this more, but it still smelled like Aquanet around my house when this came <laughs> out. So Now, <clears throat> the great Southern Trend Kill. No, th no, that's that's the record that sort of I had to swing back around on. Um, I, I thought it was too noisy and too uh, chaotic. And uh, as I slowly, in a, someone was playing uh, Drag the Waters and off that record, and I, I thought, hmm, what album is that on? And I had to go back and, and re-listen to it. And as I listened to it again, I sort of understood the transition that they were that they were doing from far beyond driven but once again another heavy metal diary extreme extreme uh subject matter and and uh and a real window to what was happening in pantera at the time mm -hmm. agreed this is the album that i know the least about i've heard it many times i would have to revisit it there are actually songs on here that i recognize the names but i couldn't tell you what song it is this one just never caught me Although Drag the Waters is on here, great. Uh, 13 Steps to Nowhere is a great song. Love the band. This is my least favorite of all their albums, and that includes the che really super cheesy first one. <laughs> this is my least favorite. Glad to have it in the collection. Um, now, my second favorite, and everybody will laugh at this, of all the Pantera records, yes, Vulgar Display, Cowboys, Power Metal, my second favorite record Reinventing the Steel. I'm going to shock the world. I love that record. I absolutely love it. There's not a bad note on nope, this album. No, not at all. This is a perfect heavy metal album, start to finish. The band was just practically falling apart at this time, almost completely broken up. They weren't even in, they were barely even in touch when they recorded this. Phil didn't even record vocals with them. No. But this album is absolutely a monster in my opinion i think they circled back around closer to vulgar display and cowboys from hell yes but even with a little more grit if that yeah. was possible for well them. they took the grunge and the grit from the previous two records and they blended it like you said with the with those first two real phil atco um releases i i think it's the I think it's the perfect Pantera record, but once again, that's my opinion. I agree. Please leave your commentary. You can't hurt my feelings. It's Those are my feelings. This is the last thing I'm going to show, and then I'm going to give an impromptu shout-out to my buddy Rory Wilson at uh, Rhino Records. He sent me this. This is a nice bootleg from around 94. Yeah, from 94. Live at Donington. Great record. It's killer sound. All of those reissues that I showed you, uh, including the Live at Donington, uh, Reinventing the Steel, Great Southern Trend Kill, Far Beyond Driven. Those are all 2LP 180 gram reissues that you can get on Rhino Records. They're all first class quality. Now, this begs a couple of questions. And I know what you're going to say, and this is where the debate will start in the comments. Okay. Old Pantera, New Pantera. Well, without New Pantera, there wouldn't have been Old Pantera. But I think 
if I have to listen to a record, it's going to be reinventing the steel, so I go with the new Pantera. I think Give Me Albums 2, Projects in the Jungle, through 5 or 6, uh, Far Beyond Driven. I think that was their wheelhouse, even though they drastically changed styles between uh, I Am the Night, Power Metal, and Cowboys from Hell, and they kept progressing. To me, that was their wheelhouse. My favorite era of the band is <clears throat> Power Metal. Uh, I do love the new stuff as well. Now let me ask you this. What do you think about them not acknowledging the first four albums? And, he, and it's kind of a loaded question. If I'm in that band and those first four albums are sitting there and I recorded the albums in my studio that my dad owned, all those tracks are there. That's begging for deluxe, remaster, reissue, <laughs> remix. And there's money on the table. And I, yep. kids, it's a business. These guys do this because they love it, but they also do it to make a living. I know they made plenty of money, but to me, that's a little cash cow sitting on the table. What do you think? Um, I would agree with you. I mean, they've re-released, uh, you know, the the Phil era records uh, in a box set that's really really cool. Um, but I think that those early ones, you know, not unlike my boys in Turban North, uh, I don't think that you should shun your foundation from whence you know. Don't forget from whence you came is mm -hmm. what my grandpa used to tell me. People that forget from wh wh where they come from are destined for failure because they don't remember. A, how hard it was, or B, how hard they had to work just to get that out. And, and it's a natural progression. So what if you change? So what if you sound different? So what if you had your sixth vocalist in six years? <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, well, you're, you're trying to find what works, and well, they, they did. Yeah, it's the Deep Purple discussion that we had. It's, it's the only guy in Deep Purple is the drummer. Yeah. The only one that's been there from day one, but they're Deep Purple. To me... Even though they change drastically, it's all Pantera. Now, let's we've talked about the records. Let's talk about the men in the band. I got grounded <laughs> before I was able to see Pantera with Terry singing. Uh, I had one shot to do that when they played Denison, Texas. I was grounded for grades. Thank you, Dad. Uh, my dad did a great job raising me, took care of me, but he... Uh, he wore me out about my grades, and he was right, but I missed that. And all my friends came home talking about how amazing and energetic it was and just bigger than life, and they all got, brought guitar picks and signed pictures, and I missed it. I saw him later when Phil was in the band, and my experience with Phil was this guy's a rock star. He was nice, but he was bigger than life. Uh, my experience mostly in meeting those guys was with Daryl. And I know you've got a lot to share about Daryl. I'll, I'll be really quick. I met Daryl two or three times in different situations uh, at some King's X shows, mostly, and then playing a couple of shows on the Power Metal Tour. And he was the nicest guy ever. Just the nicest guy ever. He'd always invite you to hang out. He would always listen to your story about Pantera, you know. Uh, met Rex a few years ago, also at a King's X show. Nicest dude ever. Got some cool pictures. He was just really down to earth. But you are the man with the connection to Daryl. Tell us about Daryl. Well, I, 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 I knew of them, and then I met them through a, a guy that used to have a, a, a store in Carrollton, Texas, a northern suburb of Dallas, called The Rock Stop. And... Um, and he introduced me. He said, "Yeah, I know this guy that it really is into Kiss." And I, I had, I had just moved up here from Houston, and had stuff in boxes, and I needed the room. And so he introduced me, and and what a super super guy, nice guy, smaller than I anticipated, because mm -hmm. you because you think he's a huge rock star, and he was kind of a tiny guy, but super nice. Paid with cash. Was very gracious. Um, I asked him to sign a few things for me just kind of because he was there and I never thought that, uh, you know, I just thought these were personal items for me. Um, the, no, no pretense. Uh, and, and even when he, he was doing the side projects, which I didn't really care for, the, the damage plans and so forth, um, very gracious, you know, what do you think? How do you like it? He was always concerned with uh, how he sounded and what how his playing was, and I never thought that he thought he was better than anybody. Mm -hmm. um, 
which was uh, a kind of an interesting thing for a guy that, I mean, you talk about a huge influence on the guitar world. And um, so I, the long and the short of it, and I know, I know I don't want to drag this out too much, super good guy, very genuine, um, love to have a good time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were you were gonna you, you had to watch your back pocket with him because you might get a bottle rocket shot from a coke <laughs> from a coke can or something, but um, uh, but super good guys wrote killer riffs, um, very humble, uh, in my opinion, and um, it's it's a it super sad to see that the way he went out because you always hear about the Pantera reunion mm -hmm. and who do you replace him with and we always hear the Zach Wilds mm -hmm. and the whatever which I think would work but you'd mm -hmm. have to call it something else you'd have to call it five minutes alone or domination mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something you couldn't call it Pantera because I think without without Daryl then there is there's just doesn't feel the same yeah and I know there's blame and shame and lots of finger pointing and all that and I don't want to get into all that. I, ultimately, I would love to see the guys that are at odds, and we all know who they are. I would just love to see those guys make up as uh, brothers and friends and just move past that. Whether they play a note together or do another thing in public again, I would love to see them just heal up the wounds and, and move on. And, and I know that, tan, that, that uh, uh, olive branches have been extended across the, uh, the barbed wire of, of the boundaries that are set up by some of these guys. Um, and I know that from personal experience, and uh, but um, who knows? You never you, know. you never can tell. So that's the beauty of music. Plus, we've always we've got these great reissues, and but the box set idea, I even might be in, uh, in interested in buying something like that. Yeah, I think that would be great if they'd redo that first stuff. Quick before we split, you had a story about this cover. Do you want to? Do you want to name? You don't have to name names. No, I don't have to name tell, names. There, tell us how it went down. <clears throat> there was a certain guy that uh, that he never he never admitted to it, except every time we would ask. And in fact, Poser Mark is my backup. Um, he he saw him, and, and every time we asked um, this certain store owner that's no longer in business about this incident of getting punched in the jibs. <laughs> um, he would say, no, man, that's not me. That's not me. But he'd do it with a big smile on his face. And the le le legend has it that this person took 13 punches to the jaw in order to capture the perfect shot. I, I think they probably got it on the first or second shot. But knowing those guys like we do, they were just teeing off until this unnamed person who owned a business in Carrollton, Texas, um, wasn't able to probably stand anymore. Yeah, or 20 had, bucks a pop. Or right? 20 bucks a pop. Nice, good so, stories. Anyway. I, my interactions with the guys were always good. Not that I know them, I don't pretend to know them. Having met them, it was just, uh, it was always a super experience. My brother and I met him at a Metallica show one time, and my brother was wearing a, a beret or a beanie or something. I don't know, some sort of a, a skater hat. And uh, Daryl and... The rest of the guys were in the crowd. They were near us watching the show. And we all took off to go to the restroom together. So our claim to fame was that we peed with Pantera. But the funny part of it was walking out uh, from the star, old Starplex out into the, the courtyard out there, Daryl was telling my brother, Man, when Metallica comes out, you're going to bang your head so hard that that beanie's going to fly up on the stage and hit James Hetfield right in the face and all that just... You know, they were still not <coughs> quite... They were still fans. Up. They were still fans, and this was Cowboys from Hell. Cowboys from Hell was out, I think. Uh, or if it wasn't, it was close, but that's the cool thing about Daryl. Like you said before, the guy just, he never stopped being a fan. No, and he loved music. And I think that sometimes you see some of these dudes that are just going through the motions, and they don't love what they're doing. And that dude loved every time he had a guitar in his hand and every time he saw somebody else like to your point playing on stage that he dug um yeah you know he they they are they're still fans i think that's important now i'm going to out you a little bit because i know oh. this and i know you're just not thinking of it right now you sold him a bunch of kiss collectibles how yes. did that happen um through this unnamed source at the uh rock, that rock may or may not have been punched. <laughs> that may or may not have been punched and um and like i said he 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 was uh, it, it was it was an awesome experience, 
and I was happy to, to that the you, you know the thing about Kiss stuff is the and we, we can go and do a whole another show about that. But you want it to go to a good home. You don't want mm-hmm. to just sell it to anybody. Right. And uh, I knew it was going to a good home, so. Yeah, uh, it was it was easier to get get rid of, and plus I had opened up some space in my six hundred square foot apartment. Uh, okay, so it's through the store guy that yeah. Daryl found. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. That's how I I'm met putting him. two and two together. You you're telling the story, and I'm not because this unnamed person together. in the store had tons of kids. Gotcha. Yes. And uh, but anyway. Okay. But maybe when Poser Mark comes up here, he can verify some of the facts. We'll get him. the Poser on one of these days. The Poser. The Poser knows. Yeah. The dude knows. <laughs> Unfortunately, he, he, he's like that gnarly little brother that you want to give him a noogie because he's just so obnoxious, but you can't get rid of him because he's, he's your little brother. You love the guy. Yeah. So. All right, kids. Find it out in the comments. New Pantera versus old Pantera. Tell us about when you saw the band. Tell us what your favorite record is. Check us out on YouTube, The Metal Roundtable. You can search us and find us on YouTube. Uh, Facebook page coming soon. It's out there. It's going to be also called the Metal Roundtable. Uh, a crash- special special graphic coming soon. Coming yes. soon. Yes, yes. So we'll get the Facebook page up and going soon. Find us on Instagram. I am. <laughs> it's always weird to say this. I am at I am Metal Rob, and he is Carcass John Art. YouTube, subscribe to the page. Facebook page coming soon. Dagan Shark Finn. Ah! We love you all. Until next time, stay metal. Metal prevail. Indeed.